So welcome everybody to the launch of Not Dead Yet. Feminism, passion and women's liberation. We are really thrilled to be uh, publishing this book and because we're the editors, we're even more thrilled. Uh, <laughs> but before we start, I would just like to say that we respectfully acknowledge the wisdom of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their custodianship of the lands and waterways. The lands on which Spinifex Press offices are situated are Jiru, Bunurong and Wurundjeri, Wada Wurrung, Aora and Noongar. We also acknowledge the many women throughout history who have fought for women's freedom and the freedom of lesbians, often at the cost of their lives. Hello everybody, I'm Renate obviously, you know that probably. <laughs> and I'm thrilled to, to be here for this first launch of Not Dead Yet. There will be two other ones that you can find out on either our Facebook or on the Spinifex Press website under events. Uh, we have to do it by time zones because um, it's quite impossible to do this one, for instance, with the um, US, but it's good to see um, women from the UK on this because for them it's just early morning. So hello, everybody <laughs> from the UK, special welcome. Um, so let me just say a few words why Susan and I decided to do this book. Actually, for many years, it's been just very, very irritating to me to always hear people either being very ageist straight out or just this belittling of, oh, yeah, 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 you've had your day, but now, you know, you're probably not quite so crash hot anymore. <laughs> um, but if, even if that's not the main point, the main point was when you heard some youngish woman describe something and... Um, saying like, well, for the first time she's written this thing and me thinking, oh God, <laughs> you do not know your history, dear, dear heart. And then also thinking, and this is the important point, how should young women who sort of de tentatively uh, call themselves, you know, feminists or lesbians, how should they find out what our history was when nobody is actually talking about it anymore? So um, Susan and I thought, oh, well, we'll do our, a little contribution from Spinifex, and since it's our 30th year anniversary, so if we look tired, it's because we are. Um, we saw, well, what better year than actually do this book? So how did we go about doing it, Susan? Okay, on the how, um, well, first of all, we sent out invitations, and uh, almost everybody we sent an invitation to said yes, just a few didn't. Um, and before we knew it, we had 56 contributors and we said, oh, we've got to stop, we've got to stop or it's going to be too big for us to afford to publish it. So and they all had to be over 70. Yes, everybody. Oh, wow. We had a few 69ers, including myself, um, <laughs> who would have loved to have contributed, but I'm four months too young. So, oh, <laughs> oh, sad. So, however, I was roped in in spite of that. Second edition. Um, second edition. Hey, what was that? Second edition, you get in. Yeah, second edition. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. we'll reverse the names on the cover then. <clears throat> um, so how would we put it together? We were a bit worried about this because it was so varied. And so I went about putting things at the beginning, things at the end, things in the middle, and then I kind of drew it together after that. But I also had to balance out, you know, beautiful poetry, the, the fiction, the, the autobiographical pieces and, and others. I mean, there were also such a huge range of pieces actually was really quite tricky. But we got it together and then we thought, how on earth would we write an introduction? So again, I started the process and started writing about the particular pieces and, and so forth. And then Renata came in and she made it into a really good introduction. So we have discovered after 30 years that we're a very good team. We've thought of you this before, but it's been reinforced by the process of, of doing this book. <clears throat> 
So, um, if I just may add just two more more sentences to that, um, it was actually quite quite interesting how I mean we've done quite a few anthologies in our spin effects life and even oh. before, and um, normally you have to remind people saying now it's the deadline. Do you think you can do it? Can you send us your piece? In this book, we actually got the contributions up to two months early. We just it's never happened to me. It was so that's why I think this book is really, really filling an incredible gap. And so far, the reactions have just been fantastic. And one more sentence about why we did it because Renata kept saying, Not dead yet. <laughs> well, that would be a good title. So, <laughs> so we went on from there. So now I'm I'm going to go briefly through uh, the 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 women who are going to be speaking tonight. Uh, first up is Helen Daintree, followed by Corazon Valdez Fabras, Sandra Shotlander, Prue Hyman, Betty McClellan, and finishing up with Diane Bell. And then we'll have questions afterwards. If you have a short question, uh, no, and then we'll have contribution contributors saying a few words about the book also. So um, they get first go. Um, and after that, if there's still time, um, we if you want ha have a question to ask, please put it in chat so that we can see uh, see what's there. And Rachel, I hope you'll be able to keep an eye on that. Um, okay, so I'll do a brief introduction to each uh, speaker before they go. Helen Daintree, who lives on Kwandamuka country, has been a social scientist and educator with a focus on feminism, sexuality, women's health, sport and capitalism. Despite polio as a child, she became an elite cricketer, competed with success in track and field at the Gay Games in 2002 and as well as Masters Games. She is currently very active in the Coalition of Activist Lesbians, also known as COAL, the only national lesbian specific advocacy organization, organization in Australia. Over to you, Helen. Thank you, uh, Susan. Hello from Karagara Island, Kwandamuka country in Moreton Bay, Queensland. I pay my respects to the elders past and present on the land that I love living on. Thanks to Susan and Renata for the opportunity to join in this way today. With so many other feminists uh, and a project which inspires girls and women to stand up for their rights and to admire each other's passions and their uncelebrated contributions. When I was writing, I'd often sit pondering the next sentence, and I'd often smile despite my wrestling with the terrible word limit because of the connection I felt with old feminists across the world, all of us reflecting on the same historic years and events and our lives of, as women of today, and all of this sharing for this particular anthology. My title, Surely Not, Says Who? Wait a minute signals my alarm and my often disbelief at the speed and form of new strategies and levels of economic and political power being mobilised to de-sex, dehumanise and de demonise women. And it speaks of the continuity of my feminism since the 1970s. I like to identify who exactly is speaking, in whose interests are they speaking? And I need to oppose the economic and social powers that are mass producing misogyny and silencing dissent. Wait a minute, I want time to organize with other women and to be critical. This is why my political activities have rapidly escalated after the rather low key 70th birthday party I had. My story covers just one month based on the entries on my calendar. A book launch, a coal meeting, a 20 minute live stream presentation, a book, a bush care working bee, a live feminist movie premiere, face-to-face -face meetings, 
And this doesn't include the constant writing of submissions to state governments about self-ID and conversion practice legislation. So here's a little entry. October 17th, F2F Brisbane. The face-to-face -face feminist discussion group was started by Anna, specifically to focus on gender identity ideology and develop a broader understanding, sort of pre-digital consciousness raising. Detransitioners is today's topic. Heterosexual women are often shocked and express utter disbelief to discover the insidious nature and profound implications of gender identity ideology. However, for lesbians, it is a more toxic version of what began back in the 1990s. The radical feminist IWD March in Brisbane, also organized by Anna, has been boycotted by the unions and political parties because she fiercely defends women's sex-based rights. Surely not. October 20, FDKI. The feminist discussion group meets first and third Tuesday on Karagara Island. We have shared ideas, we have shared ideas and delicious food for more than four years in a room looking into the island's lush community garden. Sylvia has chosen poetry as the topic. We compose haiku and one of the lesbian reads hers to wild applause and warm laughter. Menstruator, I'm more. Bleeder, where? To general, please. Woman, that's me, yes. October 19 to 25, the bird count. My partner and I stand scanning the sky and trees, participants in the nationwide citizen science project held annually. Our home on the Bay foreshore has a passing parade of seabirds, forest birds and small birds like Rufus whistlers and honey eaters. Two 20 minute observation periods results in 26 bird species recorded, two more than last year. October 22, lunch. It's another water bus trip off the island, a lunch with old friends and radical feminist authors and publishers. Sadly, unlike nearly everything else on my calendar, this event does not reappear each month. What pure pleasure. Because Queensland suppressed the virus and enjoys very few restrictions, it's a delightful catch up in person over some forgettable dishes. October 24, Red Matildas an online movie event. Made in 1985, it tells the stories of three remarkable women in the 1930s. Joan Goodwin, horrified by the impact of unemployment and growing militarism, worked for social justice and the peace movement. Audrey Blake joined the Young Communist League and promptly lost her job. Surely not. It's lovely to recognize some familiar faces in the Zoom audience. COVID and digital technology have given rise to so many opportunities to be in the company of courageous women and easy access to international discussions and in radical ideas without the exorbitant travel insurance for the over 70s. So while ever women and lesbians are being desexed in full view of the United Nations by our political and cultural institutions, this is no time for me to retire and allow peak organisations to demonise our voices and steal our rights. Here's to a time when the word lesbian is spoken with kindness and respect, and to long delays in the need for my advanced health directive. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm just finishing a, a, a thing in uh, the chat. I'm putting up a note to say that in connection to what you've just said, uh, that we are publishing a book on detransition in September, and we're publishing a haiku diary by <laughs> by Sandy Jeffs about the pandemic in November. So um, that's just to keep you all interested. We're doing the catalogue at the moment, and uh, so that's the other thing that is at the top of my brain. Our next speaker is Corazon Valdez Fabros from Manila in the Philippines. Um, she is a, an amazing activist. She is a lawyer by profession. She's currently the vice president of the International Peace Bureau. 
She's been active in a number of organisations advocating for peace and denuclearization, including stopping US military bases in the Philippines. She is a founding member of the National Union of People's Lawyers and is chairperson of Peace Women Partners. Welcome to you, Cora. The sun and uh, good, good evening or good afternoon to everyone who are with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, what a privilege and an honor to be part of uh, this uh, endeavor. And uh, I think um, I should thank Phoenix uh, Express for this uh, privilege. Uh, particularly Renate and Susan, who have been really, really, uh, you know, have been very patient uh, with, with me in, in their reminders. Uh, uh, because uh, towards the, the uh, approach of the deadline, I, I was really uh, tied up with work for the Asia Europe People's Forum. And uh, you know, every time I open my email, I would see uh, MDY, you know, a, a reminder coming from Susan and, and at, at some point Renate. And I deeply appreciate that I was um, at the same time uh, been, uh, what do you call this, uh, a tentative in terms of, you know, should I talk about myself or should I talk about you know about about the campaigns uh, that I have been involved with, and I at, at some point I I felt that uh, I should talk about myself because that is what the book is all about. So that is when I I really uh, sat down and put uh, them in writing, and uh, um. It's actually, you know, I, I feel very grateful about this project because somehow it gave me the uh, push and the opportunity to kind of look at what I have been doing, you know, uh, since I was, uh, I started college. It was like a, it was like a narrative that just uh, uh, opened itself to me. And I, I started looking at, you know, how I, I started. And that basically explains as well the title of my, uh, my, my article, which is uh, from, uh, from onlooker to organizer. Yeah, I think that's where it was because um, I don't know if it was Susan or Renate who came up with that uh, title which I, I, I fully agree uh, eventually. Um, you know, uh, how life has been for me uh, from the time I got involved with the movement, uh, including uh, uh, the time when we were trying to, you know, to, uh, to get rid of the dictatorship in the Philippines, a very uh, uh, sad and difficult uh, situation that we had. Uh, and somehow I also kind of had, uh, while writing this article, uh, gave me the opportunity to, to, to feel, you know, that, uh, that I have filled the years uh, meaningfully as well. And uh, I think um, I, I, that is what this article and being part of this book meant to me at this point. So, um, of course, the limits of the 2,000 words that were given to us, I, I have actually exceeded it. Um, well, it's not enough, actually, but I, I, I think that uh, what I'm going, uh, what I'm saying this, this afternoon is that uh, uh, this book has uh, started me uh, going into, you know, more of review and thinking about maybe this is something about starting a memoir that I should be writing, uh, that I always just keep it in my mind that wanting to do it, but I have not started doing it until today. 
So uh, thank you, Susan and uh, Renate and, and, and Spirit Express for this privilege. Um, I also think that uh, writing the article has also, uh, you know, uh, in rekindled the, the strong sense of hope on my part. You know, uh, looking at the difficult periods of uh, my life and my activism, um, especially, you know, <laughs> going through a near-death situation and having survived it, it is something that, you know, makes you uh, look at life twice and, and, and review it, you know, while, while you're there. Uh, but uh, surviving it as well is a, a sense that gives you a sense of what? Gratitude, but also a sense of responsibility because it is like, I don't know if some of you have felt that at some point in your life, that you have been allowed to continue living because there is something that you should, you should be doing. So that's, uh, that's, that's hope. And I think it has always been, to me, uh, you know, I, I, I got that near-death experience when I was 22 years ago. Um, and, and so uh, it, it also gives me a sense of responsibility and a sense of promise at this point that I should be uh, doing more writing. You see, I, I'm not a writer of, you know, of articles like this. I, I am more of uh, the uh, person who strategize and do things, and I don't put these things in writing. Maybe some of you are like that, uh, but uh, this contributing to the book has given me that impetus and that confidence <laughs> that <laughs> that I can write something that's that's about me and that's about you know my work. Um, so, uh, at this point, I think I also wanted to read a certain part of my, of, of my article, if you will allow me that, Susan, uh, just to end, uh, in what I'm going to say, and, uh, uh, towards the last part of my article, I said, at almost 72, but I'm now 72, actually, <laughs> so I have written this a month, before, my article a month before my birthday, and I said, at almost 72, I feel I am at the peak of my engagement in the people's movement for change. I continue to reimagine our world beyond this pandemic that continues to grip the world with uncertainty and fear. At the International Peace Bureau, we reimagine our world and try our best to act for peace and justice. That's actually our theme and call for the second IPB World Peace Congress in Barcelona, Spain in autumn of this year. A few days ago, I got my first vaccine dose and in a month, I will get the second. A complete expression of my will to live meaningfully. And uh, I tell myself, Every single day, I will survive. I pray for more years for me and for the women, fellow travelers of my lifelong, particularly of my long life, particularly my mother, who at 90 looks younger and more hopeful than I am. A bedrock of strength. I thank her for giving me life, sustenance, and understanding all these years. What a privilege to be alive today and to be fully conscious of my worth as a woman and as a, an activist who is part of the people's struggle and resistance against injustice, militarism, and patriarchy. I draw inspiration uh, from Rosa Luxemburg, who once said, being human means throwing your whole life in the scales of destiny 
when need be, all the while rejoicing in every sunny and every beautiful cloud. So I feel grateful. Thank you so much for being part of, you know, courageous and uh, wonderful women who know how to celebrate life, to dance and to, and to love music. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cora. Thank you very much. And if we have inspired you to write a memoir, that is very, really thrilling. I look forward to reading it. Uh, our next speaker is Sandra Shotlander. Uh, Sandra lives on, Wur on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Her play, Angels of Power, was the inspiration for the very first book published by Spinifex. It was called Angels of Power and Other Reproductive Creations. She founded two theatre groups, the Plantagenets and Melbourne Mime and Mumble, a theatre of the deaf. The dialogue that she's going to read tonight called Phone Call in the Year of COVID-19 is possibly yet one more in the series Collected Phone Calls of Gertrude Stein and others. Sandra. Welcome and please come on. <laughs> and thank you, Sue and Renata. And I will read my phone call in the year of COVID-19. No, darling, I'm not dead yet. Not yet, still breathing. Well, I must be, because when I spoke to Cynthia, she asked me not to speak right into the phone because she could hear my breathing. Can, can you hear my breathing? Then I must be alive. Or am I a ghost arisen from the grave? I, I'm sorry, I know you care, but I've just heard on television that it is not life that matters, it is lifestyle. Was it a Mr. Foster said it, or someone like that, some official or health expert? Dr. Foster went to Gloucester in a shower of rain. He stepped in a puddle right up to his middle. Puddle, middle, muddle, lifestyle indeed. I have a life. And I want to continue having a life that is more than just a lifestyle. I'm sorry, I don't mean to shout at you. Oh, such strange times we live in. Yes, I know, you must be fed up with the restrictions. All these restrictions for a tiny virus. But of course, we're all being reminded of our parents, that is, your grandparents who went through Spanish flu, depression, two world wars. But you and I will never forget 2020, the year of the virus. I'm so glad we can talk to each other. I'm fading away. I'm fading away. No, no, I I'm all right. I'm perfectly all right. It's the connection. It's just the telephone line. Well, you know, my life's not much different here in my meditation retreat centre. Meditation retreat centre, that's what I call it. Well, that's what Cynthia said I should call it. Well, you are not here because you are across the border. No, 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 I totally understand. No, you can't visit me. These restrictions are made to make us feel safe. You know, crossing borders has been one of my missions in life. But not now, no, no, no crossing borders. Crossing borders, crossing boundaries, roads, rivers, oceans. Passes between mountains, impasses between people. You have to navigate. Oh, I'm sorry, um, where were we? 
Oh, don't forget it. Charlie is with me. She's on my lap purring. Say hello, Charlie. She says hello. Who would have thought you and I would be alone, Charlie? But not alone. Crowds of people in my thoughts. Oh, yes. Crowds of women on the streets. The first Reclaim the Night march in Melbourne. Ah, there we were, marching through the streets. Yes, yes, in 1979, violence. Violence against women. Being safe on the streets and in the home. Has anything changed? I can see us again in the 80s. Marching in overalls without makeup and without shaving our legs, although I didn't have to shave my legs, being in a higher state of evolution, as Cynthia would say. Brazen hussies we were. And then there were those women in Queensland, Mo Thornton and Rosalie Bogner who chained themselves in a public bar in Brisbane in the mid sixties when women weren't allowed in public bars. Oh, of course, brawl and chain tactics have been used forever in protest. The echo feminists chaining themselves to trees. Zelda de Prano here in Melbourne, 1969, chaining herself to the Commonwealth building over equal pay for women. When a policeman commented on her being alone, she replied, next time there will be two, then three, then hundreds. Ten days later, she chained herself to the arbitration court, joined by Alva Geeky and Thelma Solomon. And following that came the Women's Action Committee and onwards to a Women's Liberation Centre in central Melbourne. Muriel Matters, Australian actress, went to live in England and became a suffragist. Yes, gist. She chained herself to the grill in the Ladies' Gallery in the House of Commons, Westminster. Well, women had to sit behind a grill so the male politicians below would not be distracted by them. 1908, I'm talking about. Now, having chained herself to the grill, she made a speech to the men below on votes for women. The first time a woman had ever spoken in the House of Commons. Oops. Our own Muriel Matters our colonial rebel. Finally, she was escorted from the gallery by two attendants, one on either arm, with the grill still attached to her, being carried by a third attendant, a grand exit. Oh no, dear, no, no, I couldn't do it. I could never shackle myself to anything. Well, I have to my writing desk but only metaphorically. Now you are fading, you are fading away. Is it my end or is it yours? Well, we didn't have any trouble when phone calls had cords and were attached to a wall. I oh, know, I'm a troglodyte. Do you know, I didn't even realize that I have to vote in a forthcoming council e election because I don't have a mobile phone. And Cynthia, is she still protesting? Oh, yes, she is. Well, not on the streets. She's writing letters to the editor right now rather than protesting outside the local IGA store. What's she protesting about? Development, animals, destruction of wild animals, destruction of nature, destruction of Aboriginal heritage sites by mining companies, vandals. How could it be allowed? Oh yes, and she did join in the Black Lives Matter March. Yes, yes, she did. 
I always remember Audrey Lord's words. You know whom I mean? Black American lesbian poet who came here to Melbourne, 1985, to speak in Language of Difference, Women Writers Week. It is not our difference that divides us. We have to recognize, accept, and celebrate our differences. Ah, oh, it felt so right navigating together with our words, listening to each other, reaching out towards each other, and afterwards. There are such celebrations and friendships. Whoops! Can you hear those beeps? Call waiting. Oh, don't worry. Will just be someone wanting to sell me something or some survey. Nothing can be done now without a survey. We are not salient beings anymore, simply numbers or percentages. After all, we all know these days that economics is more important than lives. Well, yes, I heard that. Yes, I did. 60,000 people die in nursing homes in Australia in a year. Of course, uh, Mr. Colbert, our Minister for Aged Care in Canberra, could not tell us how many of those people die from neglect. He did say that 60,000 deaths was a lot of deaths, but that's what nursing homes are for. Uh, should we say we are going pre-mortuary when we go into a nursing home? No, honestly, I'm listening to you. I eat well, I cook my own food, I walk, I garden, I'm fit as a fiddle. I'm going to watch TV tonight, escape to the Greek Isles with Bethany Hughes as she follows Odysseus on his return from Troy. Last week, she told us about Odysseus commanding his crew to tie him to the mast of a ship to avoid succumbing to the sirens. Have you been wooed by a siren lately? No, neither have I, more's the pity. I don't think future Generations will know about Greek mythology or any other mythology or ancient history. It's all STEM these days. And yes, I do know what that means. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics. But what about arts? History, literature. With the new government funding for the universities, even social work fees will rise, while STEM subjects, exactly, they will be subsidised. It seems the root of the plant will be watered, will not be watered, but the stem of the plant will be watered. No, it's not right. Well, then we must be some good news, something cheerful we can share. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, what, what? Oh dear. Yes, of course, we have to stop. Your batteries are going. Oh, well, I'll bring you back. Oh, no, of course I can't. You have to recharge. Well, I'll, hello, hello, uh, gone, gone. Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> uh, I think you need a second edition of your phone calls book. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, our next speaker is Prue Hyman from Aotearoa, New Zealand. She is a lesbian feminist activist and feminist economist with many years working at Victoria University of Wellington. She has worked for and been a consultant to the New Zealand Ministry of Women's Affairs, involved as organiser of New Zealand Women's Studies Association and been on the board of the International Association of Feminist Economics. The world could learn a great deal from that group. 
She is currently active in uh, the Living Wage campaign. Welcome to Prue. Thank you, Susan. Tēnā koutou katoa from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and greetings to you all. It's wonderful to be with you. I'm one of uh, four New Zealanders in the book, so I wanted to pay tribute to the other three, as well as all the other older feminists around New Zealand and around the whole world, both represented in this wonderful book and those who could be in it, but uh, are either like Susan half a year too young or, um, or just some room for everybody in here, but uh, it's a wonderful selection. The other three New Zealanders are Sandra Coney, Philip Bunkle and Alison Laurie, all big names here and uh, pretty well known around the world as well, I hope. Um, Sandra and Philida have been amazing women health movement activists. They worked together in fertility action that then became women's health action. And uh, they worked together on the national women's hospital issues. That was an amazing um, controversy and scandal where um, a leading doctor essentially experimented on women with cervical cancer by um, not treating them. And uh, it uh, all got hushed up and then it came out and there was a big inquiry, the Cartwright inquiry, which Philip and Alison pushed for. And uh, it, that inquiry, the result of it made a huge difference for women's health in New Zealand. Um, they could no longer, the medical system, get away with quite what it did before, um, which doesn't mean that everything's perfect, of course. Uh, Philida also became a member of parliament for uh, the Alliance um, on the left and um, I said a great variety of other things while Sandra edited Broadsheet, New Zealand's major feminist magazine, which lasted for 25 years until 1997 and uh, later he had and still has a local government and in the environment on issues there. So uh, there two chapters are well worth reading. Um, while I mentioned Broadsheet, another editor of Broadsheet was Pat Rosier, who was my partner for 17 years. She sadly died seven years ago. Can't believe it's that long, um, very suddenly. I much appreciated the mention of her and 16 other wonderful feminists and lesbian feminists who've died in Susan Renata's splendid introduction to the book, um, as well as all their all their massive amounts of work on the book, of course. The fourth person in the book is Alison Laurie, who like me is a lesbian feminist and actually used to live in Paikakariki, a tiny village on the coast where I am now, where I still live. She now divides her time between Denmark and here. But uh, so we were both, uh, we are both lesbian feminist activists and academics. Um, her chapter is a brilliant, succinct history of, of lesbians and lesbian feminists in New Zealand over the last 50 or 60 years. She actually mentions lesbian radio, which I, um, I just wanted to touch on as a former stalwart of a weekly program. She and her then partner um, were the main people doing it weekly for, oh, I don't know how many years, 15 years or more. And then a collective took it over and I... Um, I uh, was convener of that collective for 10 years or so. And uh, she says in the chapter that she, I still present the program monthly and just keep it going in an era in which it has become mainly one for queer women. Sadly, and it's worth pointing this out, this is now out of date. Like much stalwart lesbian and feminist speech, I've been silenced by the trans extremist movement as far as that program is concerned. I was chucked off the collective that I convened for years by the queer women who'd basically uh, taken it over uh, for being anti trans. I don't regard myself as being anti, certainly, like many in the book. Um, which is attacking women's and lesbian rights and is causing a lot of backward movement for our rights, um, which I think we have to watch out for terrifically. And we are being silenced. And the whole hate speech, free speech debates are really important ones too. I mentioned this briefly in my piece in the book. But most of my article in the book is about feminist economics, which is my area of work over the years and most of my writing. 
I taught feminist economics at uh, Victoria University of Wellington. And it was fun, though pretty hard, teaching courses to economics and women's studies students together. I managed to get the economics department to cross subsidize gender and women's studies, which I regarded as a triumph, but uh, it meant doing these joint courses, which was pretty interesting. And uh, of course, the women's studies students were incredibly intelligent, could write a damn good essay, but were a little bit nervous, some of them, about the models and the, the mathematical side of it, which uh, I had to do a little bit of. Um, and uh, by contrast, the economic students could breeze through the, the models, but ask them to write an essay and they couldn't do it to save their lives because they all, uh, all did nothing but mathematical modeling these days. And what was interesting was the interaction between the two of them. When I, I loved it when actually, when the economic students sort of revealed themselves, said things like, why should I subsidize your taste for having children? Uh, that sort of question uh, sort of left the women's study students, not surprisingly, completely dumbfounded, but it led to some interesting discussions. Uh, while I was in an academic economics department, I had to take some care about how I tore apart orthodox economics. I used to teach it and try and uh, uh, say what was wrong with it at the same time, but I had a lines to cross. Now I'm retired, I have, I have no need to take any care whatever. I can say exactly what I like, which is a great relief, and I'm sure it's partly why some of the, um, the transgender stuff and, and, and our, our issues on it, why it's our older lesbians who, I mean, A, we have the experience, but B, we haven't got to worry about actually losing our jobs, which sadly, many of the younger ones do if they say what they think. Um, so and now I'm retired, as I say, I take no care. I say exactly what I want to, and my agenda is, is pretty straightforward and simple, and I'm sure you'd all agree with most of it. It's simply get rid of capitalism and all race, gender, and class discrimination, get, and uh, every other form of discrimination dismantle all the power structures, prevent the exploitation of big businesses and their hold over governments, vastly reduce earnings differentials. They have little or nothing to do with productivity. They're just a con. And uh, the power again is what determines what people are paid. Um, I'd have greater rewards to labor generally and less returns to capital. I'd scrap the current monetary system and money just being used to make more money. We'd value the planet and its resources properly, its animal, vegetable and mineral resources and, uh, and its water and air and so on. We'd stop squandering all that and we'd stop humanity causing climate change and all the disasters that we're seeing all the time now, far more frequently, a hundred year disasters occurring every year. And uh, we'd spread the resources far more evenly between people, groups and countries, valuing all the unpaid work done in the household, still vastly more of it done by women, and unpaid work done in the community. Now, of course, that all sounds very simple. You know, that's all we've got to do, merely completely have a revolution. Um, I can't pretend I know how to get there. I wish I did. It's very hard. But having the right wonderful women and indigenous people, the ones, not all women, but the right women um, and the right indigenous people in most of the decision making positions would be a start. Maybe if we all believed it was possible, it would be possible. We certainly have to persuade the next generations uh, about all this and we have to listen to them as well. Um, many of them um, have unfortunately been, been uh, led astray by by the sort of trends I've been talking about, but an awful lot of them, I'm very relieved to say, are very sensible and we need to listen to them. And we have to have the dialogue and make the changes while we have the chance. While I'm having, I'm 78, I intend to live to 100. So for the next 22 years, I intend to keep trying to, um, with other women and with other lesbians to, to make the changes we need to make. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Prue. Gee, I hope that agenda can be fulfilled. That would be fantastic. I do have to inform you that Colleen Clare was born in New Zealand and she is also a contributor to the book, but she came to Australia. So that's why oh, you don't know her. Sorry, I left her out. <laughs> Hello, Colleen. Um, okay, our next speaker is Betty McClellan. 
She lives on Mulguru Kaba uh, Bindal Guru Badhun land. Uh, she's a feminist ethicist, psychotherapist, author, and activist, a founding member of the Coalition for a Feminist Agenda and chair of the management committee of the Queens of Queensland Women's Health Network. She has long worked with Indigenous and non-Indigenous women in the area of domestic violence and health issues. She's the author of five books. Her book, Help, I'm Living with a Man, crossed out, boy, uh, has been published in 16 languages. It is our most translated book. Thank you, Betty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Susan. And I am speaking from uh, Wulgarugaba uh, Bindol lands, and uh, it's wonderful to be here and also to acknowledge the uh, elders in this area. Look, I'm just finding all the articles in this book so inspiring, so interesting. Uh, I haven't got through the whole lot yet, but I'm reading it very carefully. And I, I, I'm enjoying it not just because a lot of the articles reflect my own position, in feminism, um, but also because it's like we haven't lost the passion. We haven't lost the passion that we had back in the 70s and 80s. And so, like, it's really exciting to revisit all of that and to hear, to read that, that so many of you are writing in that way too. Um, really, what I'm saying is we haven't lost the passion for the revolution, you know, the revolution that never actually came but we still have that kind of passion. Um, and I, I, like you, I'm sure, uh, sometimes ask questions like, well, what happened? Um, why did the movement as we knew it uh, peter out? Um, why have young women in greater numbers not taken up the mantle that we prepared for them? And, you know, then I remind myself that this is a different age. You know, if we were uh, teenagers and young 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds in the 50s, we would, like, the dominant social thing in the 50s was to love your husband and to have babies. Like, after the war, that was the whole thing that, we, that society was supposed to um, um, think about. But then we were lucky because in the 60s and 70s, the big focus was on social justice and liberation. And that's where the great liberation movements began, at least in our, um, in our century, the great liberation movements. But then, of course, after that, uh, like in the present time, I remind myself, because of neoliberalism, because of postmodernism, the emphasis is on the individual. And so, of course, young women are, are being born into that way of thinking, and there's no way that we can change that. But, you know, even with this determined focus on the individual, I can see the revolution continuing. Younger women are finding a way. It's got to fit in with what, the, what the, um, the, the, the expectations are in the society that they're living in, but they're finding a way. It's so different from the way we did it, but it's happening. Um, look at the Me Too movement. Do you remember? Like, I mean, we called it a movement, but it was really an individual thing. But what courage those women found to start talking about the way they'd been abused. And here in Australia, Australian of the Year, Grace Tame, she's been able to talk about the way she was groomed, about the way children are groomed and sexually abused. Brittany Higgins um, bravely spoke out about being raped in Parliament House. You see, all these things are happening now. This is the revolution in this, uh, in this decade or in this century. Uh, then follow, following that, the March for Justice protest movements. Wow, how wonderful were those marches. Um, and what about the friends of the woman known, as, known to us as Jane? 
um, that her friends, even though she herself committed suicide, her friends have not allowed her rape by someone who is a high profile politician today, that her friends have not let that die. This is part of the revolution. They've not let her memory and the memory of what happened to her fade away. And you know, even when you look at the ABC program at the moment, misrepresent, misrepresentations, is that, is that what it's called? I mean, it's just like, I mean, that happened because that is happening now because of the things that we were able to do in the 60s and 70s. All of it constitutes the modern day revolution. And while none of the younger women realize it, perhaps, they are able to be so courageous because of us and our movement. Now, you see, when I, when I, was, when I first became a feminist, I wasn't saying, oh, this is because Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and, and all of those women um, before us were able, I, I mean, we didn't, I didn't realise that. And so I can't really think that the, women, the young women of today should really yet know about us. But there will come a time when they'll also be interested in, in reading their history and they'll read this book, this wonderful book, and they'll see where all of their courage has come from. Now, in, in finishing, I just want to, I, I must say, Cora, you actually stole what I was going to say, but I'm still going to read it anyway, a piece from Cora's um, article. You, uh, Cora said this very thing. She, two, two things I was going to say from your article, Cora. And you said them both right now tonight. But I think this is so exciting. At almost 72, and Cora has told us she is now 72, at almost 72, I feel I am at a peak of my engagement in the people's movement for change. That's so exciting. And also, she goes on in the last paragraph to say, what a privilege to be alive today and to be fully conscious of my worth as a woman as an, an, and as an activist who is part of the people's struggle and resistance against injustice, militarism, and patriarchy. Like I found that so inspiring, Cora, so thank you for that. I also just wanted to say too that um, um, Judy Atkinson's piece about I am impatient for change. Yet with, with the infinite patience and grace and strength of Mandela, she says, I will forge a path of healing through my words and actions. And we know Judy as an indigenous woman, the healing that needs to come because of racism, as well as because of uh, sexism and misogyny. So I guess I just want to finish by um, uh, just quoting a few words from my own piece right at the end. A question for all of us is this. In our old age, will we rest on our laurels, retreat into ourselves and become the sweetie everyone wants us to be? Or will we fight on with every ounce of energy we are granted? It's a no-brainer. We will fight on. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> absolutely, Betty. We will fight on. And um, to help us fight on just a little bit more, um, I want to introduce Diane Bell. She's living on Ngunnawal land, is a feminist anthropologist and social justice advocate. She's the author of 10 books, including The Daughters of the Dreaming, uh, sorry, Daughters of the Dreaming and Ngarinjari Wurrawarun. In 2001, she was awarded an Order of Australia Medal, that's an OAM. She worked in the US for 17 years, living, leaving in 2004 when George Bush Jr. was re-elected. 
She then spent eight years in South Australia working with the Nurunjeri people and on environmental issues and is now in Canberra. Diane, over to you. Thank you, Susan. And I apologise for the sunglasses. I had to have a laser procedure on my eyes this afternoon, and so they're still recovering. Right? I am not actually in incognito. This actually is Diane. Right? So, Yuma. Greetings from Ngunnawal country, and I pay my respects to the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal on whose country I live, and particularly to their stories of survival. Um, here in a chilly Canberra, the seat of government, the site of storytelling, much of which is in need of the testimonies, analyses, wisdom, humour and grit that Renata and Sue have gathered together in this volume. And we've just heard from the speakers. In fact, there's very little for me to say because you've said just about everything that needs to be said. Um, so thank you for bringing it all together in Not Dead Yet and for bringing this group of women together. Um, thank you and congratulations to all of you. Now, I've been mulling over what a radical feminist might say of the gendered impacts of the compounding crises of 2020, of the mega fires, the suffocating smoke, the destructing ha uh, hailstorms we had, and then COVID-19, along with unemployment, stimulus measures, recession, social isolation, shutdowns and quarantine. It seemed to me that under the cover of COVID, a systematic a systematic starving of segments of our society and hollowing out of key institutions was in full swing. What is to be done? I decided a feminist manifesto was in order. Now, it was written before the wheels fell off the vaccine rollout that was all spin with no substance, but my questions are still seeking answers. Who is the all that is all in this together? <laughs> What principles, priorities, values are being evoked? Whose narrative prevails? We've been here before. We had reference to the Spanish flu. These are not unprecedented times. And there've been warnings, plenty of them, from epidemiologists for decades that we should be planning for future pandemics. So what's wrong? Well, I turn to Adrienne Rich. What does she say? Name the phenomenon, she says. Those who are the most obvious victims will also, or those that are the most obvious victims will not be able to name it and then no, will not be able to claim their own experience. So what names have we got? Second wave feminists gave us the word sexism. But remember, it existed long before we had the word. The practice certainly predated its, uh, its coinage. Uh, Zealus Einstein named capitalist patriarchy as the mutually reinforcing dialectical relationship between capitalist class structure and hierarchical sexual structuring. Paula Moyer recently gave us um, misogyny noir to our vocabulary. So let's tell a different story with these words. Let's know our feminist history. Now, 1943, the year of my birth, if one had been in Sydney, one might have attempted, attended the Australian Women's Conference for Victory in Peace and War, where Jessie Street brought together the Feminist Charter and a Feminist Manifesto. Now, I really want you all to read this, you know, dig it up and read it. There's a link to it in, in my, my chapter. Um, it addressed a whole raft of women's issues including paid, unpaid work, childcare, equal rights, the needs of country women, Aboriginal women, all there, read it and weep. Now, why did the charter fail? Well, it didn't gain any traction with the key architects of the post-World War II reconstruction. Women had certainly shown themselves to be skilled workers in male occupations, and then they were manoeuvred back into the home. Sound familiar to our pandemic? So we need a plan that recognises these interlocking regimes of sexism, racism, classism. Now, I've been looking at the feminist philosophers and what they've been saying in terms of articulating an ethic of care that shifts the focus to relational thinking. So away from that privileged individual that carries those rights closely to their chest. Um, to a society of connected network of variously situated people that distinguishes those with prerogatives and power from those who are stigmatized and disadvantaged. COVID has revealed vulnerabilities are not evenly distributed and they are not personal failures. 
they are the consequence of structural inequalities. Women's embodied experiences of caregiving positions them as knowing subjects whose voices must be heeded by decision makers, not because of their gender per se, but because under patriarchy, care work is devalued, familial, it's not public, and it's not a political import. And this is what these feminist philosophers have been working on. It's really interesting work that shifts the whole moral debate, moral discourse. Um, all right, so I, in my plan, which I set out in my manifesto, women's stories of personal embodied experience, like the ones we've all been telling tonight, become a social good, a core component for a just, fairer and less violent society. And yes, Prue, we need an economics for this. We need an economics of care. Um, caring work, it's the social glue that keeps our society functioning. But how is it costed? Step up the feminist econ uh, economists. Um, I had cited Marilyn Waring on work that doesn't count, women's work. Old work, it's been there for ages. Now, manifesting uh, my manifesto, uh, you can read it. Uh, but manifestos have to, people that are doing it, manifestos, uh, we need to have a bit of optimism. So here's my charge in turbulent times, and I'm now reading from the book. Never waste a good crisis. Act now. Hashtag, organise, don't agonise. Equality reforms, equity transforms. Pursue a wild politics of purpose and persistence. Thanks, Sue. Allies be damned. Let's be comrades in the struggle. Eschew intergenerational matricide and hierarchies of hurt. There is unfinished work. And there will be music for our fellow manifestors. So to the tune of All Among the Wool, let's have a rousing chorus of, oh dear man, I've just lost it. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. Oh no, 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 no. I had it keyed on my machine. All right, I'll have to do it myself. Let's have a rousing chorus of Glenn Tomasetti's 1969 Union song. Do you know it? Don't be too polite, girls. Don't be too polite. Don't be too polite, girls. Don't be too polite. Show a little fight, girls. Show a little fight. Don't be so fearful of offending in case you get the sack. Just recognize you. Mm -hmm. we, we won't. Don't look back. back. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, dear. Thank you so much, Di. Um, nice to finish with a song. Absolutely. Um, we would dance if we could. Yeah, we could. If We, we would dance with one another if we I were in the same I love that would be part of your revolution. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do now is I would like to invite other contributors uh, to put up their hand. If you go down to reactions on the lower right hand side, just to the left of end, you can put your hand up there. Just click on that and you'll see a hand up um, bit. And if you want to speak, um, then please do that and um, hopefully we'll be able to see you. We'll have to scan along the, the things and, and try to find you. If you are not a contributor and you have a short uh, question, please feel free to put that in the chat section and we will come to you afterwards. So I can see hands up, I'm just having a quick check. Um, I can see um, Lavender, Jean Taylor, uh, somebody else I saw, Patricia Sykes. Patricia Sykes. So um, let's start with you three and I'll keep scanning to say, Colleen, do you want to say anything? Um, okay. Um, so it was Lavender and Jean Taylor and Patricia Sykes, that order. Please um, turn off your mute so that you can speak. Lavender, okay. unmute. Yep. Okay. I'm unmuted. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Susan Renato. I mean, it's fantastic to have real feminism. <laughs> uh, you know, Spinifex Press does it, uh, which you can't really um, compare with. Uh, I mean, it's just way out there. But I just wanted to um, have a. a just say a few things about my contribution about 
silly young girls and hairy legged lesbians. And um, I deliberately made the title as short as that. Um, but, I, because, but I was tempted to actually say in the country in the 70s. And it's become a bit of a theme in my life lately uh, since I've quit the metropolis, which was, um, oh, I don't know, a couple of decades ago now, um, that many people, including our dear feminist sisters, kind of forget about those of us who are feminists and feminist lesbians out of the city. And so that's why I wrote about those early days um, of my consciousness raising and working collectively as a feminist and being impassioned by women's liberation. And in Armadale on the Northern Tablelands and the, the, New, the New England, which is often seen as a very posh area, but it was pretty um, down to earth in many ways. And uh, we've got someone else here this evening that was in the Women's Collective with me. Hi, Janie. <laughs> Your memories may be a bit different than mine, but that's okay. And uh, I, I just kind of want to give a plug for those of us who live outside the city. I mean, yeah, I can go down and have coffee with a feminist or a has-been lesbian. Oh, did I say that? That was very naughty, wasn't it? Um, but you get my drift. But, you know, it's the sharing of things. And I kind of feel with this digital collection of, of great women here on screen tonight that we're sharing such a lot. And so I want to thank you all and particularly Susan and Renata and Pauline for what you've done. Thank you. Thank you, Lavender. Okay, over to you, Jean Taylor. Okay. <clears throat> uh, yes, I'm coming to you from the Wurundjeri Wurrung language group of the Kulin Nation and uh, thank them for allowing us to be here for this time. Uh, I, I, when I got the book, which is quite a sizable, wonderfully big book, which I like, um, I was delighted and uh, delighted to be included and delighted to he read everybody's contributions. Um, I still haven't gone all the way through it yet. I think it's a very dense and very complex book and uh, as it needs to be because we've, we who have come through the women's liberation movement in the 70s and 80s particularly, but uh, and most of us are still going into the 90s. We had all of lesbian festivals during the 90s and of course for the last 20 years most of us also have been working on our various projects and uh, writing and publishing and all the rest of it. And I think that uh, given that this is the 30th anniversary book for Spinifex, it was a very appropriate book and um, a wonderful um, way of uh, celebrating 30 years of publishing. And one of the things that I really enjoyed was that everybody's over 70. I'm actually 77 now. And um, all of us are slowing down. I think slowing down, not able to do as much as we used to do. And that's a very common thing for, for growing older. And we never ever really took that into account when we we're in our 20s and 30s and 50s and even 60s. It wasn't until I was into my 70s that I was really not able to do as much as I, I had been doing. So even though we're still very active, we're active in a different way. And I think that connecting theme of the set, being over 70s um, made my heart glad that I'm in company with so many women around the world, so many radical feminists, radical lesbian feminists around the world, uh, who are still as active and as engaged uh, as I am too, because I can't even imagine not being uh, a part of this revolutionary force. So, so just to thank everybody for their contributions. I'm absolutely enjoying every single one. And it's just absolutely wonderful. And, um, and also tonight too, to see everybody's faces and to hear, I think hearing our, our stories too is a marvelous opportunity. Um, I'm hoping to get to the other two launches as well. So I can hear other um, writers speaking and, and reading their stories too. So thank you all, wonderful. Thank you, Jean. Okay, Trish, Trish Sykes. Um, <laughs> I'm also speaking from Wurundjeri 
Wairuarangand. So acknowledgement to all the people past, present and to come. Um, I just wanted to congratulate you, Susan and Renata, for the 30 years of wonderful publications, but also for this book. Even though I'm due to turn 80 in December, I feel incredibly young in feminist terms. I was one of those who lost her mother in childhood, um, and we spent some years in orphanages, were then sent out to work at 14 and didn't get an education until I was well into my 30s. And the only reason I got to university was because Whitlam abolished university fees. Thank the man. And that's where I met Diane Bell who created spam before the internet ever heard of it. Because school terms and university terms did not coincide. Diane and a friend set up this organization called Student Parents Association of Monash. So during the school holidays, uh, we took over the gym and the sports field. We all took in games and toys and, you know, for outside toys as well as inside toys and rostered ourselves on for an hour a day. And all of these women came out of their kitchens into the university. Um, it's one of my great gifts. Um, to have been able to get an education as, as an adult through uh, Got, Gough Whitlam, but also Council of Adult Education. And my feminism has been kind of incidental, accidental, falling through doorways, through gateways, uh, reading mostly. Um, I became a high school teacher and it has informed my choices as a much older woman. Having read some of these wonderful articles, and I haven't by any means even got halfway through the book, because each article I read takes me on that woman's journey and a journey through her experiences, which takes me back to my own. Um, but I didn't have the opportunity to write a personal memoir and submit it because a beloved sister was in the process of losing her large bowel to cancer. Um, so I sent in two poems, one that looks at a child's life and then from the, the aspect of looking back as an adult, because for me, the whole important thing about women's stories, and I've always been a storyteller in one way or another, is continuity. Understanding what we've inherited. <clears throat> There's a wonderful story in a collection called Daughters of Copper Women. And they're the stories of the Nootka people um, of Canada. And when what they used to do with their young girls was walk them through the ocean, not just forwards, but backwards to strengthen their legs. And when it was time for a girl's first bleeding, they would row her out into the ocean, drop her into the ocean, and she had to swim back to shore. All the people of the tribe were on the shore with great bonfires calling her in. And the women did this because for their survival, they had to have strong women. And those stories, I fed on those stories as well as the stories of our own people and indigenous people for strength, insight and courage. So I thank you all. And it's lovely to see your face, Diane, even behind our glasses. Patricia, can I, can I say something? Sure. 
SPAM, Student Parent Association Monash, we had the name SPAM before we figured out what it meant because that was from Monty Python, right? <laughs> was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we wanted a name that would have some, you know, cachet. But I want I wanted to tell you a sequel to this, right? So we occupied the sports centre. I insured it for a quarter of a million, right? And oh. that so you were all covered, all right? And um, the vice chancellor called me in, right? And he thought he was going to get to kiss babies. Instead, there were all those bolshy kids that were with us, right? All our school children, right? <laughs> who had mothers who were trying to do it as single mums, etc. So he called me in and he said he didn't want to see all the children. He just wanted to talk to me. And I knew that was dangerous, right? So I went in and he said, Mrs. Bell, what was it? <laughs> Mrs. Bell, you're a very good student. You're a very good politician. You'd better decide what you're going to be. I said, I think I'll be both vice chancellor. And he said, Mrs. Bell, <laughs> one of the things you need to remember is that universities were not made for people like you. <laughs> and I said, well, vice chancellor, universities will have to change. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> um, I just want to mention five other contributors who are here at the launch. Denise Thompson, Colleen Clare, Kay Johnston, and from Britain, Elaine Hutton and Lynn Hahn. Um, so thank you to all of you for coming this evening. Um, uh, do any of you want to say anything? If so, unmute yourself and speak. Um, <laughs> and are there any questions? Uh, in I haven't seen any chat questions from anybody, but uh, if you have them, you'd better get them into the chat right now. Okay. So tell us how the book's being received. You've got one review from Phyllis Chesler. Yeah, I think that's pretty cheeky. Um, Phyllis, who's in the book, has written a review of the book, which why not, you know? She declares her hand. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, there should be a great deal of it. So if any of you who are contributors want to write reviews, go ahead. And those of you who are not contributors, feel free to write a review as well. Um, it has, well, it's hard to know because... Uh, Phyllis did send me a list of, uh, send both of us a list of things that people are saying about her review and the book and so forth, and they were wonderful. Um, what, what has been really interesting is the number of books that are going out, um, and that is fantastic uh, because, uh, you know, when you're a publisher, you need to have books to sell. Um, mm -hmm. It's very important. And um, so far... Do I get the prize for buying the most? <laughs> I don't know. How, I don't know how many you bought. Oh, Pauline had known nine. Nine. Fantastic. And a few more to be ordered yet. Oh, excellent. Yes. Put in your multiple orders as well. Um, <laughs> and and just, uh, just to add I that. I think I'll... Cora bought actually more than you, Lavender. I think <laughs> she bought ten. <laughs> <laughs> This is not a competition. No, it is not. <laughs> not, yet. Not, yet. <laughs> not yet. Just to, just to add that I wrote a review today and I'm going to send it off to Olock. Oh, Olock. good. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Jean. Yes, yes. Yeah. That is wonderful. I was and, I, and I'm donating uh, copies to uh, various libraries around here and to the University of New England <laughs> as they oh. feature in it. All these so, universities uh, who wanted to get rid of us. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have at least two who wanted to get rid of me, um, and clearly there are others in that case. So the other thing, then, um, over to you, Renata, to say some thank yous. And um, or oh, before I do that, I'll just remind you that there will be launches in the US and uh, in the UK. The US one in Australia is on the 5th of August, but if you happen to be in the US, it's the 4th of August because of time zones. The launch in the UK and Europe and Eurasia is on the 19th of August. So if you want to attend those or you know people who might want to, then spread the word. Renata. Yes, thank you very much, Susan. Well, first of all, 
of course, my big thanks go to all the contributors. The ones that have spoken this evening or have been here, but the other, all the others as well. I mean, the book is really phenomenal because of all what you've written. And what struck me or strikes me is the, is the diversity of the pieces. And I'm saying this with a tongue in cheek because obviously uh, diversity is a buzzword these days, but in this book, there is really true diversity. Um, and they're funny stories like Cheryl Adams piece about going walking. If you haven't read that yet, it's really wonderful. What a 72 year old woman, I think she was at the time, uh, can do and surprise a young um, English bloke. Um, then as usual, I really want to thank the Spinifex team without, as you know, we wouldn't exist. Uh, we really wouldn't exist without the incredible tireless work of Marilyn Damiano, our office manager, and her new, well, not so new anymore, helper, um, Cheryl. So thank you very much for both of you, to both of you. Uh, then Pauline, Pauline yeah. Hopkins, super yeah. editor, super eagle eye who sees all the mistakes. This was a very big book to keep track on. Um, especially also the e email addresses because half of them always <laughs> came back. So then we had to figure out why. So thank you, Pauline, really from the depths of my heart. Um, we, one other thing I wanted to actually say, we did, we included all the pieces we were sent. We did not knock back a single piece, which I really think says something. I think they're all of really, really good quality and they're all really, really interesting. So Pauline, thank you for keeping us all on track and doing the permission letters and all the tedious bits behind the scene, but also doing uh, the editing together with Susan and me. We are a really good team. And um, then Rachel, Rachel who has been the co-host of this event and who's teaching us all the new uh, things that we need to know in this new techno world and if you have uh, had a look on our website which has been much improved which is really mostly um, Rachel's uh, work she also sends out these fabulous newsletters and I'm sure you're all now uh, subscribed to our newsletters and if you're not please do so and Caitlin who I think was here before not sure if she still is from Perth who does our social media and occasionally has, very occasionally, I have to say, has to cope with cranky people who, you know, want to say not so nice things about Spinifex. Um, but mostly they say very nice things about Spinifex. So thank you, uh, Caitlin, for keeping us out there on Facebook and Instagram and whatever. Thanks to, uh, thanks you. Thank you for that. Whoa, now I'm losing it. Thank you to you for all of this. And lastly, but not least, thank you very much to Susan. And as you said, we have been a very good team. We are a very good team and work extremely well together. Sometimes we do finish our sentences. I know, we try not to. And then we have, of course, a third member of our family now who now needs to make an appearance. I'm surprised that she'd been so good. Um, she is, of course, in our book. And it's our new, well, it's not so new anymore either. She actually had a birthday this week. It's Nala, who is our dog, who doesn't, see, who doesn't seem to want to come up. She was sound asleep. Ah, oh, Nalina, come on, show your pretty face. You have to lift her up a sure. bit more. Come on up. up. Can she sing for us, please? Oh, yes, yeah, she could sing. She could sing. Start but... singing happy birthday. I know she, she can sing. She's the very best singer of Happy Birthday, but she obviously doesn't want to sing. In the she I just disturbed her. Maybe we, we try to um, we try to educate her for the American and for the British launch. <laughs> and, and get her oh, into sing. Up too. I <laughs> so I too. think that's enough for me. And I thank you all for really coming to this event. And uh, it, it, as it was recorded, you can then see it again on YouTube. And um, maybe see you at the next event, but keep looking out for our new books. Um, Liz Murphy has a new poetry book and then the de-transitioning book by Max Robinson. And then later also in October, the new book by um, Janice Raymond, 
Um, the first time she has written a book on the trans stuff since the um, transsexual empire, and it will be, or well, it is a ripper. We're editing it right now, and it's called Double Sync. What's the subtitle? Feminist Challenge to Transgenderism. For some Two reason, I can never remember it. <laughs> and it's a really, really, really good book and will get us lots of new friends and probably some not so new friends. But we are strong girls. We'll keep on fighting the good fight. So thank you to all of you for not being dead yet, for not being sweeties, for not being nice, for being hashtag queens like Diane Bell, for keeping on singing and barking and just making an awful lot of noise and um, not slowing down. And I actually saw Elaine Hutton saying, I disagree with Betty or whoever said, no, with uh, Trish, I think we're not slowing down. Well, yes and no. I mean, we're slowing down a little bit, me in the morning, but we're still here and we're still fighting. So have a very nice evening. Um, and if you do drink, raise your glass to all of us. So the, as the inscription in the book is to the young women who are now old. Thank you and see you. <laughs> so Bye. I have <laughs> just Bye -bye. three things <laughs> to mention before we sign off. Um, when I mentioned the contributors who are here, I missed Eileen Haley. Eileen, I'm sorry I missed you. Um, also, Sharon Murphy is our warehouse manager working with Marilyn. And finally, I'm going to share the screen so you can see how to order the book. And um, we will go to the third, one, uh, the third one. Here it is. Here is all the information on how to order the book. So uh, the easiest way in Australia and New Zealand is directly through the Spinifex Press site. But do tell bookshops that they are missing out if I don't order a book. So feel free to spread the word amongst booksellers. So thank you, Susan and Mara. Thank you for the book and thank you for this launch. Thank it was you. wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for every to everybody for speaking and for coming along to the launch. It's been wonderful to see you all.